Welcome to Live Live! We started this mini-series last week, and I say mini-series because I have no idea how many weeks it's going to be. Um, I'm, it's just getting revealed to me a little bit at a time. So Change Your Life 2013. Today we're going to talk about how to get to the end of your rope. Anyone feel like they're at the end of the rope? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know how you feel. So today we're going to just cut to the chase and just get there. We're going to get to the end of our rope. But first I want to do a review. I want to do a review about last week and the anti-fruits. Did anyone pick some fruits this week from, from the fruits of the Spirit? You can raise your hand. Anyone picks any fruits? No fruit pickers? Got a few maybe? It, you know, the Bible is funny. It only works if you actually do it. it. You know, reading it and not applying it doesn't work. So we're going to have to work on picking our fruits. So last week, basically, what we talked about was there's these things called the fruits of the Spirit. And, and when you have the Holy Spirit in your life, He gives you, He makes these fruits available for you. And they're joy, peace, patience, self control, goodness, kindness. I think I forgot some. But. And basically, there's these anti-fruits in our life that are the opposite of those fruits. And if we find ourselves dealing with a lot of anti-fruits, it's because we haven't picked up the sack lunch that God's prepared us of the fruits we need for the day. God said He will provide for us every day what we need. And um, we pray for that when we pray the the Lord's Prayer, and He will provide. So that's a little review last week. We're going to continue on... um, Changing our lives here. Early, early 2013, we're going to continue walking down the chain. So, what does the phrase, be at the end of your rope, mean? Well, out of options, right? That's generally what it means when you're at the end of your rope, you're, you're out of options. You're done. It also is bad, right? It's not, I'm out of options and everything's wonderful. It's, I've, I'm out of options and everything's not so good, Okay. You want to know where that originally that phrase originally came from? It originally came from tying up a horse. They used to tie up horses and let them eat. And uh, when the horse ate everything he could eat, he was at the end of his rope. And we can look at that two different ways. We can look at that being a bad thing, that they're at the end of the rope and they can't reach anymore. I also want to think of it in a different context a little bit. The end of our rope originally meant we were at the extremes of our reach. We were as far as we could go. Are some of you jumping ahead of me in the sermon a little bit now? We were at far as we could go. Here's a phrase I used to utter about three, four, or five years ago. I can never do that. And the person I uttered it to was none other than Mr. Dave Huff. He'd stand up here and every week he would deliver a sermon. And four or five times a year I would deliver the sermon. And I was stressed out to the max and pushed completely to deliver those first four or five sermons a year. God just was not providing words for me to say. And I always had conversations with David and said, how do you do it week after week? How do you do it every single week? How do you keep coming up with new sermons? Why don't, you know, have you ever been tempted to go back and preach one you preached, you know, four years ago or two years ago? And I said, I could never do that. And those of you who've been around here a while know that they've contracted pancreatic cancer and I have to do it. But I found out that I was right because I can't do it. There was no way that I can do it. I had to come to the end of my rope and say, without God, there's no way I can do this. And I had to come to that decision very, very quickly because I happened to be covering for Dave one Sunday and he called and that Sunday morning and said, Things are bad. I'm in the hospital in Memphis. I need you guys to pray for me. I don't know what's going on. And you know, about 18 hours later, I got the call that I've got really advanced pancreatic cancer. And yeah, he preached a few sermons after that, but for the most part, it was me. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't deal with the fact that that Dave had cancer. I was now in charge. All this other stuff. And deliver sermons every week. And I really struggled with it for a very long time. But the fact of the matter, I had to come to the end of my rope. I had to say, you know what? The rope that of my ability is about this long. And I need to be about twice that. And I'm not going to do this without God. 
There's no way. There's this term in Christianity called consecrated. It's a big fancy word. I don't expect a lot of you know it because it's just not something we use every day. But basically what it means is declare or set apart as sacred. It's something they did in the Old Testament when they made their offerings. They, they consecrated their offering. They said, you know, th- we're going to make this sacred. A lot of times if you go into a, a church you know, where they're having communion, they'll consecrate the, the bread and the, the wine or grape juice. Make it sacred. Make it holy. Set it apart. One of my favorite quotes, and it's attributed to D.L. Moody, and actually he didn't say it, but uh, you know he was involved in the saying of it. And uh, A man told D.L. Moody once, the world is yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to Him. And D.L. Moody replied, by God's help I aim to be that man. Basically what it's saying there is someone told D.L. Moody when he was very young that if you are fully turned over to God, if you are fully consecrated to God, if you are fully sacrificed to God, there's no end to your rope. Because now your rope is God's rope. And maybe you guys heard the name D.L. Moody. Here's a picture of him. He was the closest thing to a mega church pastor in the early, basically late 1800s there was there ever was. He was an evangelist. He was based out of Massachusetts. He would literally speak to get this, imagine this, in the 1800s, 16,000 people at a time. He would would fill these huge auditoriums. He traveled all over the United States, all over Europe, and, you know, he would preach to two, three, four thousand, sometimes 15, 16, 20,000 people. The people that he knows that he brought to Jesus Christ or had something to do with them being saved, numbers in the tens of thousands of people. He started many Christian colleges, many Christian high schools. Um, the Moody Bible College is associated with him. And he will tell you that he did almost none of it. It's because he decided very early on that he was going to be fully consecrated to God and he was going to let God work through him. So we've got some examples in the Bible of people that are consecrated to God. Uh, many of you know the story of Abra- Abraham and Isaac. We'll, uh, we'll do some little history here and kind of run through it just for those of you who don't know. Abraham has promised descendants. This is Genesis 15. And this is actually when his name was still Abram. And here we go reading from Genesis 15. This is from the New Living Translation. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you're giving me no children, Eleazar of Damascus, a, ser- a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. And God replied to him in, in verses 4 through 5, Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count me the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. Now we'll tell you, at this time... In Abram's life, he was not fully consecrated to God. God was talking to him. He was having one-on-one conversations to God, with God, but Abram didn't have it all together yet. Why is that? Well, he had this wife who was named Sarai at the time. So it was Abram and Sarai. And God made Abram this promise and said, you're going to have a son. And you're going to have so many descendants that even the number in the stars is not going to be able to count them. So a few years passed and Abram and Sarai got together and said, well, this didn't happen on our own. You know, Sarai says, hey, I've got this servant. Why don't you go see her for a little bit and see if you can have a son with her? And he did. As you might imagine, nothing good can come from that. So there was all kinds of problems and, and basically Ishmael was born. And if you're interested, you can study where Ishmael's descendants ended up. But um, they're in the Middle East. And basically what they said, you know, what God said of Ishmael is everyone's going to fight him. His entire life, all his descendants, everyone's going to fight Ishmael. So Abram and Sarai did not wait for God. He had God's promise, but he decided to act on his own because he wasn't at the end of his rope yet. 
And then God came back and said to Abraham, Regarding Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai. From now on, her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and give you a son from her. In other words, let me make this perfectly clear. Okay? Stop taking things into your own hands. I have a plan. It's been the plan all along. And yes, I will bless her richly and she will become the mother of many nations. Kings and nations will be among her descendants. By the time God came to Abraham and told him this, he was 99. Okay? Ishmael was 13. Okay, so this is 13 years after he took things into his own hands. Doesn't really say how many years it was from the initial, initial promise, but we're talking 13 years. So he's 99. God comes and says, you're going to have a son from your wife. You should name him Isaac. So Isaac was born. The son of promise. The son that God had promised all this time. The son that was going to be the descendants of kings. You know, kings would be his descendants. Isaac was the promised child. And the rest of the story was, it doesn't say how many years, but, you know, in the story, um, God tells Abraham to go sacrifice Isaac. The son that he had promised him, he had told him to go sacrifice Isaac. And it doesn't say how old Isaac was, but he was old enough to carry wood. So, it was a few years. Long enough to Abraham, for Abraham to get attached to his son, I'm sure. Since that happens in about three hours. Um, so he tells him to go sacrifice his son. And he does. And he does. Very willingly takes his son to the mountain, takes wood, takes fire, builds an altar. About the time he's ready to kill Isaac, he hears from God, Do not lay a hand on the boy. The angel said, Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. At that point, Abraham was at the end of his rope, and knew where God's rope began. Abraham was fully consecrated to God. Abraham was turned over. There was not a piece of his life that wasn't available for God to use. God knew where his heart was. God knew the one thing that Abraham loved the most, and that was his son Isaac. And he said, I need you to give that away. And Abraham said, yes. And because of that, God knew where Abraham was in his relationship with God. You see, Abraham reached the end of his rope before he reached the end of his rope. And that's the two different definitions. Before Abraham was in a bad place, before he was in a bad situation, he knew where he ended and God began. Before he was in dire straits for not obeying God, And if we scroll forward to the New Testament, it's the same concept. There's just some different words. Consecration kind of goes away, and, and there's some different terminology. It's died to self, born again, crucified with Christ. And this is all throughout the New Testament. You can find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, along with Galatians, Acts, Revelation. It's completely throughout there. Die to self, born again, crucified by Christ. And here it is from Matthew. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn... From your selfish ways, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And see, maybe you've read that verse a hundred times too. Maybe you were saying it with me in your head as I read it. Maybe you've got it memorized, but you know, under this context, looking at the, the fact of consecration and looking at the fact of being fully given over to God, looking at the fact of being at the end of your rope, when Jesus said, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. I don't know about you, but that takes on new meaning for me. The new meaning is literally, if you try to live your own life the way you want to live it, then you're not getting what I promised you. 
You know, we accept Jesus Christ and we get this promise of eternal life because He died on the cross for our sin. And He's saying here, you've got to come to the end of your rope. You've got to understand that in your own power and under your own will, you will lose your life. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save your life. And I will fully admit, I've read that verse I don't know how many times and it never made complete sense to me until prep for this sermon. And it's because of the context that it's in. The context of crucified with Christ and born again and and living this life that's fully turned over to God. Because the, the fact we have to understand is the end of our rope Is the beginning of God's. The end of our rope is the beginning of God's. Where we reach our extremes is where God takes over. And why is that? Because God likes to let us know that He's in charge. And not in like terrible ways, but just in in ways where it's very obvious that it's a God thing. Very obvious that we didn't win it. And the story that immediately comes to mind is, is this story of this battle where there were too many men and it'd be too easy to win. So God starts peeling them off till it gets down to 30. And He says, okay, with 30 people, go attack. And when you win, it's obvious it's because you're following God, not because of your own strength. And God continuously tries to do that with us, Right? continuously tries to get us to the end of our rope so we'll trust Him and makes it obvious that we can't do things in our own strength that we can do in God's strength. If we want real change in our life, it's time to get to the end of our rope. It's time to understand where our boundaries are from ourselves. It's time to admit that we are not perfect people. It's time to say... I can't do this without you. And it's time to do it before we're in a situation where we have to. It's time to get to the end of our self before we get into a situation where we've got no choice. If we want real change in 2013, it's time to get to the end of our rope today. And this looks different for every person. This looks different for every person. See, For Abraham, God knew that Isaac was the one thing that he could test him with. It was the one thing that he was held on to. There was another man in the Bible who Jesus knew the one thing that he was hung up on was money. And when he said, what do I have to do to get to heaven? He said, give all your money away and come follow me. And the guy said, "Hmm, I don't think I can do that. And it would have been really easy for Abraham to say, you know what? I don't think I'm sacrificing my son today. And it would have been really easy for D.L. Moody to go, you know what? I don't feel like preaching constantly. I don't feel like traveling all over the world. I don't feel like being an evangelist. D.L. Moody died at the age of 41. Congestive heart failure. He probably didn't feel like preaching much the last few years of his life. So if you want real change in 2013, if we want real change in 2013, what we have to do is figure out what our Isaac is. God already knows. Maybe He's already pushing you on it. God already knows what our Isaac is. God already knows the one thing that we say is off limits to God. Maybe it's our finances. Maybe it's our children. Maybe it's our school. Maybe it's our work. Maybe it's our friends. Maybe it's a lifestyle. Maybe it's some shows we watch or some internet sites we visit. Maybe it's some habits. Maybe it's just the fact that We know deep down inside we're just going through the motions of being a Christian and we show up at church every Sunday. And God wants us to take that next step and be fully turned over to Him. 
And I'm preaching at myself as much as I'm preaching at you. If there's areas of our life where we said God can't rule, God can't tell me what to do with, God isn't the first person I go to talk to when I have issues about this. And we've all got them. We're human. We're imperfect people. We've all got them. We've got to identify those areas and turn them over to God. Allow Him to sacrifice them. And maybe they go away. Or maybe it's like Isaac and He just wanted to make you turn it over. We need to figure out whatever our Isaac is. Or maybe it's our Isaacs. The areas of of life that maybe we don't feel comfortable praying about to God. Or maybe we, you know, when we ask for prayer requests, we don't feel like we should mention that. Maybe it's your unspoken when we have the you know, when we ask for prayer requests, we all have unspoken. Maybe those unspoken are your eyes. Whatever it is, we need to do it today. We need to figure out what that Isaac is. We need to figure out what is keeping us from being fully consecrated to God. What is keeping us from being wholly turned over, set apart, sacred, crucified with Christ, born again, turned around, given over. We've got a funny analogy. I, I know pastor's kids turn out like pastor's kids because their parents use them in sermons. So I'm try to limit it, and this is two weeks in a row. But I just something hit me funny this morning. My, my daughter is in that two-year-old stage where I scream about everything. And what she doesn't understand is that if she would just ask, I would give it to her. But yet she screams and I don't know what she wants and she just screams and screams and screams and screams. And it's, no, I don't want that. No, I don't want that. No! And I'm like, if you just tell me what you want, I'll get it for you. And it struck me. God goes, Now you know how I feel. And I said, ouch. But we are like that, right? When we're not turned over to God, we're like, but God, I want this and I want this and I want this and and I don't want that and I don't want that. And He's like, you know what? If you just go down this road, it's at the end. If you just take this step I've been trying to take, you can have your fruit snack, okay? Right? Right? We're so scared to be fully turned over to God because we want what we want and we want it the way we want it and we want it now. And God says, if you would just listen to me for five seconds, I'll give you what you want. It's just going to be my way. That's the struggle we've got. That's what we have to get past to get through the real change. We have to get past our whining self. And say, you know what, I'm tired of this conversation with you being one-sided. I'm going to shut up and I'm going to listen. Instead of whining about what's going wrong in my life and whining about what I want and whining about why you won't do it in the timing I want it, I'm going to shut up and say, what do you want me to do? Which is what we want our kids to do, right? Just listen for a second. And that's what God's calling to us today. Just listen for a second and I'll tell you how to get there. To that end, I'm, there's a new book coming out. And we're going to start talking about it next week. And it's called The Ten Second Rule. And it's basically a no-nonsense way of following Jesus Christ. And I don't have my hands on a book yet, but I've, I've read enough to know. That it's basically the the mantra is figure out the next thing you're reasonably sure Jesus wants you to do and do it. Now. Ten seconds. 
So we'll talk about that next week. If you would, bow your heads. I don't know whether you're a Christian or not. I don't know if you're sitting out there today. or Maybe someone drug you to church. Maybe you drug yourself to church. Maybe you haven't made a, a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. I want to give you that opportunity today. It's very simple. It's not a long, drawn-out process. You can do it right where you're sitting. You can do it right now. You can take advantage of that 10-second rule and just jump through it and, and do it. When We tell the story that when Jesus was on the cross, the thief next to Him said, Jesus, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus replied, Today you'll be with me in paradise. And if it's just that simple to the thief on the cross, it's just that simple for us sitting here in Lifeline today or watching at home on Ustream. It is just that simple. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you. I want to make a change in 2013. I want to accept you as my my personal Savior. And I want you to make a difference in my life. I want to be fully consecrated to you. I don't even know what that word means. I never heard it before till today. But I want that. I want to be turned over to you. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of always being reminded of where the end of my boundaries are. Where my abilities can get me. Where my will will get me. Where my wants and desires and, and needs and methods, where they end up. And I know, Lord, if I just shut up for a few minutes, You'll tell me where You want me to be. And what you want me to do. And I know that your way is better than my way. It says it in the Bible and I fully believe it. And you've shown it to me time and time again. If that's the decision you want to make today. Or if you want to recommit to Jesus Christ today. With all heads bowed, I want you to just catch my eye, raise, my, raise your hand. Let me, let me pray for you this week. There's no pressure. I'm not going to make you come up here. Thank you. I just want to give you that opportunity. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we just thank you and praise you for you being a father and for you giving a son. I, I can just imagine, Lord, when, when you told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac and then you told him that he didn't have to. That you must have thought, wish I had that option. Lord, you know what it's like to sacrifice. You gave your only son. And Lord, in that context, when we hold back things from you, it just doesn't seem right. And yet we get stuck, Lord, in our in ourselves and our wants and our needs. Lord, we beg of You to help us see where the end of our rope is and where Your begins. Lord, help us to get to our end of our rope today, Lord, so we can start the life that You want us to live. We want real change, Lord. We want to live the life that You have promised to us. We want to fulfill the potential that You see in us. We want to be the person that You've created us to be. Help us die to ourselves so that we can live in You. Help us to give up our life so we can save it. Help us to shut up so we can listen. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious and almighty name.